The battle of Britain is about to begin. Welcome back to the Lead Pursuit Podcast. If you have been under a rock and have not seen the video released from Warlord today, then you might not know what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about their production values, right, Brett? Right, Steve? Spielberg, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that amazing video. What was the amazing video about, Steve? What are we going to talk yeah, about? I don't know. Today? Is that right out of like, what is it? Industrial Light and Magic over there? The Lucas I, I think it was. I, I think it was, was, I think it was done by Lucasfilm, but, but it covered Midway. I mean, it was actually more amazing than the Midway movies, all of them put together, combined <laughs> times 10. No, it wasn't. Actually, it was terrible. But anyway, okay. Hey, look, I'm not saying anything because there's, um, there's a certain document that's in uh, index proof that people are looking at. So I'm just going <laughs> to... Yeah, I know my yeah. stuff in it doesn't smell like roses. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so we we really have no uh, no stones to throw there in that sense because if you want to make fun of the campaign rules when they come out, oh yeah, there's plenty of opportunity. Uh, yeah, it was typed by three monkeys uh, with six typewriters, I think. But you know what? In, in a hailstorm. Yeah, in a hailstorm, it's done. <laughs> We're complete with that. So let's talk a little bit about the Midway Starters since the video has come out. Now, the video only showed a couple parts of the starters, specifically some models. Didn't really delve into any rules. If it was anything, it was just a, I was going to say a visual orgy of models, but that's probably not what it was. I'm really not sure how to describe it, but uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, so we know there's, there's Wildcats and we know there's A6 M2 Zeros that are both in there because guess what? We saw those today. Uh, one of the questions that other people had asked and, and I laughed the way it was asked was, Hey man, do they still have the screwed up markers and templates? Uh, no, the templates are different. <laughs> they got rid of those cardboard templates that you saw previously. Uh, I threw mine around or I would hold one up for the camera. Um, but, uh, they got rid of those and they now have plastic marker or plastic markers and templates. So they have a nine inch uh, ruler style uh, plastic template in there. They've got high cover markers. They still have um, the uh, calipers, as we'll call them. Steve, you use the calipers. You're one of those guys who's a precise pilot, right? Yeah, I do. I, I like them. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's good for making sure the people you're playing against turn the right amount. I don't use them so yeah, much yeah, when yeah, I'm I, I was going to say, how do I make them use the calipers, <laughs> not me use the calipers? Steve never used it until we started playing on, he started playing me on TTS. Now we use them all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's because you're always out there bumping models on the table, Brett. We yeah. know how you cheat. That's all right. Knock you, you don't have a cheater card. Brett has yeah. been using the like triple mouse scroll on tabletop sim. And Brett's famous words are, that's about 45, right? That's about yeah, 45, yeah. right? It's more like 90 degrees. Nice work. Yeah. Right, Cheater. Right. Hey, that's a well, the good upgrade, news. though, that, that they've, you know, compared to the Battle of Britain. Yeah. Set, yeah. That, you know, so it's... trying to be fair here, I think it's pretty cool. It is the same ones you've seen in the 172nd scale Airfix box. Same set of markers. I think it's an improvement. Uh, could we cast stones about why 9-inch, why not 9-inch? Sure. Okay. You're playing Mig Alley, a 9-inch movement template isn't going to work for you tough luck um it's it's what they've got in there for that spruce size and, and i think it's a it's a decent upgrade i think it'll uh, it'll be pretty helpful for everyone uh we know that much like the previous battle of britain set there are punch board bombers out there so you didn't see them in the video uh we've seen them out there they have japanese and u.s punch board bombers so you at least have tokens that you can move across the board and they can not doug die. they actually <laughs> it, they were in the video they were the four planes that had flat wings the cardboard punch out. How, how did I miss that? Oh. <laughs> did, did I literally? Yeah, oh, that's wrong. That's that. Oh. Now that that's a good joke. Best joke. <laughs> the only bombers with only aircraft with flat wings were the part the yeah. punch board cut, cutouts. Yeah, oh, yeah. Sadly true. Insert image from bent wing F four Fs. Yeah, yeah. So they uh, they need a little bit of love out there. Okay, we know there's still pilot discs, uh, boom chits, zoom chits, all those things that are in there. Nothing. 
none of those have been upgraded. Those are still standard uh, because they all come on the same standard pilot uh, disc card that you get. Uh, you still get your stands uh, and a, quote, good number of cards. Now, I don't know what cards we're going to get in the starter set. I'm hoping it's a little bit better than the Battle of Britain set, but hey, at least that's a, it's a place to start. It's got some theater, some doctrine, and obviously uh, trait cards. Yeah, uh, for Steve, I know you'll be brokenhearted because it doesn't have tight turn, but it has no stalling instead, which is, I mean, IJN should be your new faction, right? I mean, it's like the super cheater faction. You're, you're, not, you're not using tight turn. You're using no stalling. It really instead. is. It's actually, it's like more of a cheat list than my normal cheat list, <laughs> right? It really is. I need to switch to zeros. So, so I know how the starter set's going to go. Brett's going to be flying Wildcats, and you're going to fly zeros. That's just the way it is. He's, he's going to have the hard uphill fight, and you're just going to cheat. Okay, yeah, understand. Hey, I, already, I already have zeros painted, so I think I get to play the cheat cards now. Yeah, exactly. We're going to flip everything this time for Elite Pursuit, where Brett can be the cheater, and Steve, you got to play by the rules. I'm sorry. All right. Well, the, the good thing, speaking of rules, uh, there is a reconsolidated rule book. <clears throat> if you've been on any of our happy hours, you might have seen parts of said rule book. Not that we would ever leak something like that. I mean, we're professionals on lead pursuit. We, we don't we don't leak those kind of things. Our salaries uh, would be in jeopardy if we. Yeah, exactly. It. Warlord might cut us off from our salaries. Oh, wait, we don't get any money from Warlord. <laughs> All right. Well, the, uh, what I what I will say is, yes, we have seen the rule book. Uh, we have seen a version of the rule book. I will be honest and say, please, God, do not let that be the final print version. <laughs> but it may be. Who knows? Um, there uh, there are obviously some really cool stuff in there, but like any document, to include the campaign rules about to come out from Lead Pursuit. Uh, everybody, the day after you hit print on it, finds every little spelling error or uh, mistype or misspeak that's in there. So <laughs> for every stone we throw at Warlord for this this uh, midway set, we know we're getting at least that many back at us. Uh, yeah, it's going to be Warlord rules. Warlord podcast episode 01. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. They're going to be like, who are these guys at Lead Pursuit? They suck. They cannot proofread anything. Well, we do that. We only proofread Warlord stuff. Uh, but but you guys have taken a look at least briefly uh, at the rule book. Kind of what are y'all's first impressions uh, of how that's different than either Airstrike or different than the the smaller box set rule books? Man, I have to admit I'm not qualified to comment because I looked at that just briefly before I went on vacation. Now I can't remember what I looked at. And so I, you killed I, those brain cells, is what you're yeah, saying? <laughs> I did. You know, and I'm not sure. Like the thing that I, so I'm thinking of something that really got me excited but i don't know if i'm allowed to talk about it, it had to do with talk ten. about it talk about it all we, i'll just all edit right. it out if you say something to be <laughs> okay. we shouldn't be talking about well it was the, <laughs> the proposed new cards and stuff right uh, that i thought that was super exciting i saw some things in there i was like wow this is cool and i just think it's neat that you know adding to the range of of shenanigans right for uh <laughs> combinations yeah well and and that's something we've talked about and i know uh, Steve, you and Brett and I have, have really harped on that people have to understand the game's going to evolve and some cards are going to change and some wording is going to change. And if everybody gets up in arms over, let's let's imagine that aggressive tactics received a nerf somehow, uh, <laughs> then, then they got to get over it because the game's going to evolve and you just figure out, okay, now with the way the card is, how do I play? Uh, likewise, if you hadn't bought a box of Balmers and you didn't know about the Pathfinder card, Guess what? That changes the gameplay a lot if you're playing Airstrike. So I think it's going to be good that there's there's a lot of new stuff in there. I'll be curious to see exactly what makes the final cut on the Doctrine and on the um, on the theater cards. Uh, and then I think we'll see some really cool stuff coming out from the Aces that we've talked about that'll be tied to that midway set. I think I think visually the rule book looked really cool. You know, I thought it had a lot of just really cool artwork in it. Uh, I don't know that there that any like real changes or updates to the rules stuck out to me other than like Brett said, some of the stuff that we saw that was potentially new stuff. Uh, but I thought it looked really good. You know, I really liked the just the them thematically how it looked. Right. It was well, cool. I, I like that they, they kept that World War Two propaganda kind of cartoon uh, look to a lot of it. So the, the rule book will be familiar to everybody. They'll know. They'll understand if you're a previous Blood Red Skies player, how it's organized. It is not dramatically different. Yes, there's some change diagrams in there to help explain things. There's a couple change diagrams where they got rid of the old movement template and put the new movement template in there. So oh, you know what? I wanted to say that. <laughs> yeah. There was a really good 
a, a, a more clear uh, graphic in there that explained the wingman effect. Right. And I think right. the wingman <clears throat> effect is something that's for new players is oftentimes a lot a lot of confused because they kind of associate it with you know the plane kind of tailing their plane also and it's not it's just the plane being right. in that front arc and there was a there was a nice updated graphic of the uh of the wingman effect right. that i thought was really good in it and cleared that and i up. think there's a couple clarifications like that there that are tweaked throughout there there's some language that's cleaned up a little bit on on some of the rules but no dramatic you know changes of rules there are some more optional rules that are in there i'm not going to talk about that right now we'll talk about that in a further episode uh, but there's a few more optional things they've put in there. But once again, the, the point wasn't to change what was in Airstrike or to rewrite those rules. It was to give you a smaller subset for a starter set. So you had the basic air-to-air -air rules. You kind of had some <clears throat> built-in scenarios with air-to-ground in them or anti-shipping stuff. Uh, and then you know, people would go out and buy the Airstrike rulebook and, and go do all the big scenarios from there. So I like both you guys said, I, I, I like the visuals. You know, Perfect World, would I prefer... Uh, wonderful cover art versus models and 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 painted models and painted ships. I don't know which way I am. <clears throat> I mean, it's a it's a miniatures game, so it's always cool when it has high quality photos of the miniatures in a game being played, or at least the miniatures you know looking like they belong somewhere. So there's there's some utility there, but I think there's also a little bit of a slippery slope where um, sometimes we think those images are fancier than they are, <laughs> and so sometimes we look at it, and we're like. Okay, I'm seeing the same carrier over and over again. Okay, I'm tired of seeing that carrier. <laughs> Did anyone build a Japanese carrier? Crap, no one has that in one two hundred. So you know what I'm really digging right now that a lot of people have been doing just on the ready room, and I think there's a couple of them in the midway book, if I remember correctly, as well. Like the painted models, and then like photoshopping the real background in the back. Right. Like right. I don't know, it's kind of like, eh, you know, it's kind of cheesy, but I'm kind of digging that style right now for some reason. I'm liking well, that. There's a couple quote cheesy styles that I'm enjoying. That's one of them. And the other one is everyone who's doing the comic book battle reports. So they're taking actual, you know, photos from the game, from uh, all their miniatures being on the table, doing whatever. And they're putting in all the, the comic book commentary on the side. And I, I think that's kind of cool. I actually enjoy that sometimes more than, you know, churning through a 45 minute battle report video. <laughs> gives me the quick summary. It makes me feel like I'm reading something fun. Well, so we did mention the photos. We, we mentioned the photos of the models. Uh, I think um, the the best way I described it was, at least for me, I glommed onto the aircraft at first. And kind of was like, oh, look at those wonderful aircraft. And holy crap, there's a big ship in that one, too. <laughs> so they obviously have a 1-200 scale uh, U.S. aircraft carrier in there. Uh, it's awesome. I think it's awesome. Um, is it a bunch of models sitting on the deck of an aircraft carrier? Yes, it is. But you know what? It, it's kind of cool. Um but, you know, there's little funny little grognar details that people are going to pick apart. And and that, I think, people are missing the boat if they look at that. I mean, I get it. It's one dude's take on what the carrier looked like with another dude's probably models that were put on it by the studio. So let's not overthink this one. <laughs> I mean, literally, I looked at it and I'm like, why are there yellow tugs? I thought at this phase, you know, you know, 19, you know, this, this part of the war is still gray tugs, not yellow tugs. I don't know. But some grognard probably knows. Scott Atchison, if you know, send the info to the podcast because you probably know. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, th there's order of battle pages. Uh, there's there's information for for you to build your own scenarios to kind of tell you tell you what went on at Midway. So it goes a little bit more in depth than I think the Battle of Britain starter did in the sense that it kind of equips you to to build your own stuff. Uh, and of course people will argue because I know Ken, Nat and I will start arguing right now about the fact that there's one too many, uh, of the wildcats for VMF 221 because he put, he believes the number in the book and he's wrong. Uh, I believe the people who are actually there, uh, and in their accounts, it's one less. So Ken, you're wrong. Get over it. <laughs> well, it sounds like it's kind of instructive, right? Cause it's, it's it maybe it, teaching it you is. more about the, uh, Unlike the Battle of Britain that I think talked a little bit about it in the scenarios, I mean, there's really separate sections in there that go through the order battle and go through the battle itself. So I think it's it's a uh, it's a different way of looking at it. You know, some people may go, whatever, I don't care. I just want little airplanes. I don't want to paint them up and put them on the table. Um, others may be grognards that may pick at the numbers like I was just doing for the heck of it. Uh, but But I think that's good because I think what we found is, at least in the Blood Red Skies community, there are a lot of people that are light historians, 
you know, we're not to the grognard level of historian, but we enjoy reading about it. We, yeah, exactly. He's like, me, I'm not even sure why you would paint a, a tractor yellow or gray or were the British ones red on their carriers? I don't know. <laughs> it it but, sounds, it, it kind of reminds me of like the order of battle stuff I see and like the Osprey Malta book and stuff. You know, it's got all this crazy detail, but then, you know, you've got these charts that show who was where, when, and all that. It's, it's like they've taken a lesson from that and put it in a, in a game pack. That's kind of cool. Yeah. And, and I think it, I think it does well. I think it's uh, a little more informative than the small scenario order of battles. But once again, we're talking about a different scale and time length of a battle than Battle of Britain versus, you know, Battle of Midway, much, much smaller scale and smaller time frame. But I, I think it's pretty cool. Um, you know, could you find the same information on Wikipedia, whatever, and you'd argue over one or two aircraft. Uh, but still, I think it's, a, I think it's a useful, uh, useful thing. Anything you else, uh, you guys want to say about the rule book itself or the rules or anything you've just seen panning through it before we uh, talk about the 700 pound gorilla, AKA the models. I mean, I think people are just really anxious to see it come. I, I saw, you know, I, I saw there was a lot of response and interest in the video that came out. So people are definitely looking for this thing, right? Yeah, there's a lot of interest. And of course, you know, no matter what we do, we're gamers, we're going to be negative. So I, I, I laughed. I felt a little bad for whoever put the video together. <laughs> but at the same time, you had to know that that was going to happen. The community was going to start dissecting everything. But I think the good thing with that video, at least for me, is it didn't really showcase the Wildcat very well. It showcased, showcased the Zero, which I think was awesome because um, I think it's a pretty good sculpt. Uh, and we'll talk about that one first, you know, looking at it. Uh, it is definitely not an A6 M5 like you have in the plastic version. Uh, it's kind of hard to pick out the size differential. I I think it's more correctly sized with the Wildcat because we know the Wildcat was a little too big in the metal. The Zero was a little bit too small in the plastic. So I think they're closer together now that they're both done in resin. Um, but it, it, it looked good to me and the level of detail looked good. Will you find models out there that are more detailed? Yes, probably by Steve Toth, the guy who has never found a panel line he didn't like. Steve. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I get in trouble with my wife over that. I'm like, hey, you got a couple extra panel lines on your uh, forehead. <laughs> this yeah, week. yeah that, that doesn't play well, strangely. <laughs> Somehow she doesn't find that very funny. She doesn't get that joke. She's not a gamer. I'll ask her about that this weekend, see how that works out for me. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it, it's actually modeled like an A6M 2 or 3. It doesn't have the exhaust stacks on the side. Um, I think the canopy definition is a lot better, and I don't know if guys could pick it out in the videos, but their canopy painting on these studio models is light years ahead of what it was previously. I don't know, Steve, did you did you get a feeling of that looking at any of the, the stuff Dude, online? I've really liked the models. I thought... The, especially the zero i thought the paint job on the zero with like the little bit of like exhaust around the cowling and stuff i think the models uh i think they look good you know uh certainly when, when they actually straighten the wings out <laughs> yeah, you know that that's like my only gripe with them and i know it's like uh, my, my pet peeve i'm like guys did, did they would just look at this when you put it on the stand and what, ki <laughs> what kills me about it right is and i know warlord does a lot of their casting and stuff <clears throat> excuse me they do it in-house uh but when you see their like professionally injection molded plastic that they do for bolt action, I mean, their bolt action models, their little infantry and those plastic sprues are like beautiful. And I know the 3D models that they started with for these two airplanes were like beautiful. The fact that they don't have the level of detail and aren't the plastic that they use for their bolt action stuff is like man give us give us some of that for blood red skies because yeah, that hard I, plastic is is it, awesome, it's awesome. And, and i think that's everyone's debrief and and i know economy of scale and and there's always a concern is it will the community support that level of sales that you need to do that what are you talking uh, about i bought all the 110s just they, yeah. <laughs> there aren't any the in the revenue, warehouse anymore apparently right. <laughs> the revenue from the 110s made that an excellent profitable yeah, exactly. decision right <laughs> from, from all those and i bought all the hurricanes and had trevor paint them oh wait no uh but yeah the, i really in a sense almost wish they had invested in the hard plastic on just these two and said okay we're gonna get the wildcat and the zero done right and if everything else went to resin and kind of on demand um, once again, it's bombers. They, they, they can move up from cardboard cutouts to a resin miniature. Um, but even those, I tell you, I look at the 3D renderings that we've seen, and they just don't 
don't look like they translated to the resin models. Now, there's a lot we don't know, and we'll talk about it here in a second as we go through some of the other models. But, you know, if if someone wants to say, what's the lead pursuit quote about the quality of the models is, once you unbend your wings, they got it right on the Zero. They got it right on the Wildcat. We've got some questions about the other ones. And, okay, and, we'll and here's we'll like the real, the real big thing, right? If you compare it to the Battle of Britain models yes. that were in that, they yes. are light years ahead They're, of that. Exactly. It is. I an mean, they were step. small. They were not the right scale. You know, whether they shrunk in the packet or whatever happened, the wings were super bent. Whatever happened with those, the Shrinks models... in the packaging, that's what I tell my wife all the time. She, that. <laughs> she says it doesn't work that way. <laughs> the, mo- <laughs> the models that are in this, these models are way, way better than the yeah. Battle of Britain models. Yeah. Absolutely. I, th- I think we're always going to nitpick it. I mean, if, even if we're nitpicking, you know, let's talk about the F4F. If we want to, you know, pick on the limp prop spinner. <laughs> Maybe it needs some blue falcon pharmaceuticals, little blue pills. <laughs> but I, I think those are the things that you're going to see with any resin molded aircraft out there. Because there, so, some of them look good. Some of them don't look good. Some of them have bent wings. Some of them some of them have perfectly straight wings until the very wingtip on the, like, the left wing and it bends down. And I see that and I just say, how, how did someone not catch that while they were painting it? Um, but even in their defense, we don't know. Maybe, maybe the guy that painted them delivered them to the studio and left them in the boot of his car in the you know summer heat, <laughs> and it melted the wingtip while it was sitting out there. We we don't know. It might have looked right to him and not when they got it in front of the camera. But I think both of those, especially on the F four F, the panel lines to me look a lot deeper and thicker than even I've seen in a lot of the other resin models like the P forty. Um, so, so it really looked good seeing that painted up in the rule book in the, you, you don't see it as much in the videos. It kind of pans quickly past the F4s and then takes the, the tail shot where you see the bent wings. Um, but, uh, to me, it looked like it, it had much more detail. I don't know, Steve, you're the guru of detail. What'd you think of the F4F? No, it definitely, it definitely does. I mean, the canopies are way better, right? Like the canopy frame is going to be way easier to paint. Yeah. yeah, there's yeah, a they, lot they more better. definition there. Yeah, I mean, we're it's, making a lot of fun of them, and it's just kind of it's fun to make fun of it, right? It just is fun to do. But they are way better than the Battle of Britain yeah. box that they're like not even in the same comparable league to the metal models, right? They're they're way better. I think the canopy frame is a key definition because if you think how frustrating painting a Spitfire was with those plastic Battle of Britain models, and then when you stepped up to all of a sudden a Hurricane. Or a BF one ten, you're like, oh wow, this is this is awesome. This I have a deep canopy rail there, or like on the mosquitoes, the same kind of thing. You have a well defined canopy. Um, the F four F and the Zero both have that, and and I noticed so in some of the been, images, you know, like, yeah, thoughtful thoughtful design choices, considering this may be you know the start for a lot of people playing the game for the first time, so they're getting a better product to start with, whether it's painting Absolutely. or playing you, you're with whatever. Something you can paint that's actually you you. You're not spending all your time being frustrated going back over and changing the blue to the panel color to the, you know, and then going back and forth with the canopy. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to stop making fun of them and just say they're I, they're better. They're I got to make fun of them. It's just, to me, it's always an attention to detail thing. It's like, you're like, oh, wow, that's really awesome. And it has a limp prop spinner. <laughs> so it's one of those things. All right. So enough picking on the starter set models. We've been really fortunate. We have seen both the 3D renderings and the photos, theoretically photos, in the rule book of what the SBD, the TBD, the VAL, um, the Kate, what they all look like. So I'll short circuit the discussion and say, probably everybody really cares about the Dauntless. I, I think that that's, that's what everybody's looking for out of, the, out of the, not the Midway kit itself, but the follow on uh, and what you're gonna see in the actual rule book there. Um, I don't know. I'm going to tell everyone that I think the image was skewed. Uh, the proportions didn't look exactly right because the 3D rendering is beautiful. Uh, and, you know, we've we've all seen it. It looks good. So maybe it was an old model. Maybe it's a stand-in. That's why I say maybe we didn't see the final print production. Maybe it was uh, some other companies painted up SBD they put in there in the meantime. Uh, if there's a model I'm concerned about, it's the Dauntless. Um, maybe it was a, a bad uh, production print. Who knows? Uh, but anyway, uh, other than that, other than just the proportions not being right, I thought the detail looked good. I thought, you know, once again, like just like the F4F, you've got some deep panel lines, you've got dive break holes, you've got a lot of stuff in there. Grognards can 
can pick apart the cowl flaps and things like that. Whatever, who cares? You know, it's 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 kind of representing multiple versions of the Dauntless out there. Yeah, I, you know, I would say the same thing. I think it looks good. Obviously, the concern, the bigger planes, the bigger wing. If we're concerned about the wings <laughs> being warped, I mean, bigger wings aren't going to only help gonna with that. Any but any but. I mean, you can't short of getting them like injection molded in that plastic. And like you said, is blood red skies a big enough game to do that with in their views? Obviously not. They're going in the right direction, right? The model yeah. where they're start, they're starting with a higher quality render They're It's not metal. They're getting a higher quality casting. You know, it, it is what it is, what it is. And, you know, I think it's people have to remember, right? If you are 3d printing three of them and you mess up, five to get your three perfect ones but you got your three perfect ones for the table that's not something a company who's trying to produce several thousand of them can do right so yeah, it's kind well, of it's, you compare it's the apples same discussion to apples, we, right we've we've had that uh even when we go and print a bunch of stuff from rockworks or from plain printer for for lead pursuit uh, the fact is there's a lot of you know, off cuts. There's a lot of ones that, that don't make it that, uh, that we say, all right, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sell that one. Uh, and there's a lot of ones that just have, uh, guns that breaks, you know, vertical stay, uh, stabs that break, um, you know, parts of the wing that are misformed. So that's always a risk with the 3d printing. So even though sometimes you might say, well, I don't understand because these resin 3d ones are, are so detailed and, and look so good. Yeah, but you didn't see how many of them we failed to print, <laughs> unless you're the guy printing them. So yeah, it's totally different, you know. And the the mass production, and they're you know they are a business, and they're obviously doing the doing it the way that they think it can be most profitable for their business, and still give an improved product at the same time. So I mean, right. in, in right. that aspect, you can't you can't fault anybody for for kind of that thinking, really. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I think we'll just have to see. And and once again, like every boxed set from warlord you might get all good airplanes you might get one bad airplane you might be the unlucky guy that gets four bad airplanes who knows you might be the That's lucky guy that gets 37 airplanes in the box i yeah, mean you exactly. don't know what you're gonna get you, you know you don't know what you're gonna get <laughs> but that's what that's what warlord customer service is for and we've always said this about warlord's customer service those guys and gals are the rock stars and they make up for whatever goes wrong in the production because they'll send you more so they don't worry about it all right so let's talk about the U.S. ones. Let's uh, let's skip out of the dive bombers for a second and talk about torpedo bombers. Uh, the Devastator. So seeing the painted up model in there, I think it looks really good. I think it's got good detail. Uh, Steve, you know, I think you probably saw a lot of that too. Just looking at it, it's a it's a pretty nice setup. Yeah, I mean, they yeah they're all they're all you know they're all they look good. You know, it's the- I, I laughed. I was like, yo, what's the what's the one thing we don't know? Well. All the renders we saw, none of them had the Blood Red Skies stand adapter in it. So the big question is, just like Plane Printer, what did they do with the torpedo? How does how does this torpedo carrying aircraft fit on the advantage stand? We know with the Kate, with the metal Kate, they moved the torpedo off to the side to make that work. Don't really care. Uh, it's just a it's an aesthetics thing. It's got to fit on the stand somehow. Uh, I will be curious to see how they solve that problem with the Devastator. I'm, I'm assuming they probably just cut off the back half of the torpedo and put the, the stand mount in there, but we'll see. The um, good thing is with Warlord releasing these aircraft, right? That's going to, I don't know the right way to, is that going to, that puts them kind of into official Blood Red Skies canon, if you will, right? Yes. So like, <laughs> it's not any more like the master list airplane or the card from right. Mar- Martin's Awesome Cards that's like, well, oh, this is the... Card, so let's but talk about that. It's so, the real thing, right? Yeah. So that's the nice thing is that we're getting cards. And yes, the discussion was had as everything was going to the printers. Oh, by the way, Warlord, did you make sure you used the updated stats for all the aircraft? Um, because minor tweaks had been put throughout time to all these different aircraft. Uh, so yes, we do know that. We know that going forward for a couple different aircraft, um, especially later ones that we're going to talk about, the F6F Hellcat. Yes, all those changes got in there. Uh, so Trevor, you'll be happy to know that. Uh, but for a lot of the other aircraft where small tweaks were made, a lot of that was kind of rolled up into this rule set um, so that those cards would be fixed. The, uh, the, the one thing I will, since we're talking about torpedo bombers, I will talk about the Kate. We don't know what the resin Kate looks like because you do a little, uh, little visual research, the model in the book for at least what we saw in Midway is the exact same one as on the Warlord website 
just shot from a different side. Uh, so <laughs> we still don't know what the Kate looks like. It, does it probably look the same? Probably. They, they probably had the same 3D master, ran it through resin. Uh, it probably does not look any, any different. Um, but if you look at the weathering, if you look at some of the, the paint spots on there, uh, it's exactly the same Kate that was, uh, that was photographed in metal for the, uh, for the Warlord website. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the Val. I've been trying to hold off talking about this one because I don't want to be overly negative. Um, I, I think there's an interesting problem here when you get between grognards and the average American gamer. When we think about Vals, we mostly think about what? Things we've seen in Pearl Harbor, Midway movies, you know, and those, and, and you know, like Tora, Tora, Tora for uh, Pearl Harbor stuff. Those are all modeled to be D3A1 Vals. And you're going to go, okay, Doug, stop nerding out on me. What's the difference? The aft canopy looks different. And it looks really different. And it looks like totally different kind of airplane. Um, so I was surprised when I opened the book and it had a D3A2 model in there, uh, which is fine. There were D3A2s at Midway. That's, that's not historically incorrect. It's just not what me as an American with all my baggage about what, what, what's a Val, you know, uh, the D3A2 or the D3A1, that's what that's what always iconically looks like it. Um, other than that, it's just a different variant than I was expecting. The detail looked good. And, and I was really surprised. I mean, when you looked at the size of the little windows and the little panel marks and lines and everything that were in this D3A2, when you looked at it, you're like, wow, that's actually really good. Um, even though it's not the canopy I was expecting. Um, but, uh, to me, being able to see how good that detail is really shows off, uh, what they've done with the warlord resin. I know people are bagging on warlord resin. I mean, one of the, the comments today about the, the bent wings was, see, we told you so you shouldn't go with, you shouldn't have gone with the warlord resin. It's not the right material. Well, it, we, it's just, you're not going to have the money to do it all in hard plastic. We talked, we talked about that when they first came out with warlord resin, we had a whole episode where we talked about that and, you know, I had painted up some. And I was really pleased. And of course, my perspective at that point was how it was so much better than the original uh, box set plastic models, right? Well, I think that's what you have to keep in your in front of your mind the whole time is I could have bad bendy plastic. I, if I had unlimited money, could have <laughs> the uh, all the, the hard plastic. Uh, and then there's the two solutions in between with the metal, which we found we didn't like because it tended to flatten from the 3D model and the resin. And the other problem with the resin is you do get large chunks of, uh, of, of exhaust sprue, I'll call it, on there, basically because they don't want to take that last fine level of detail from you. They, they want you to be the person that cuts it and you the person that decides what to sand and what to fill. Um, so I know people, really, some of them lost their minds when they got some P40s and P47s that had a lot of flash on them, a lot of resin flash. I don't know. It took me like two seconds to clean that up and it just meant that I had to be detailed with it. So... Sure, it's not, I'd it's love not to... hard plastic, but it's no, it's, it's not. certainly an improvement over the old plastic. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Old, whatever that well, was. It's it's a compromise. It's something that can be churned out quickly in large amounts, uh, and is of a usable material, unlike the soft plastic, where where really you, you find yourself pretty limited with that. Um, so I think it's pretty good. Uh, I'm not I'm not too worried about it. Uh, any overall thoughts about the models or the resin or? kind of where Warlord is going with what they're putting in the box for this release and then the, the, the paired releases, the releases of the, the bomber packs and all those things. Is it, is it the Devastator that was the really beautiful model that you love so much? It's just it's <laughs> aesthetically so pleasing. Is that right? Is that the one? I, I dislike the Devastator, but only the Vindicator. Yes, the Marine Corps Flying Vindicator. That's the one that I have a place of contempt in my heart for, that they could like light one on fire in front of me and I really wouldn't care. Yeah, so <laughs> there are some, some not very aesthetically pleasing aircraft at that phase of the war on, on all the sides. So, All right, well, moving on. So one of the last things we're going to talk about is how the scenarios are different. Uh, the, the fact is when you get this Midway box set, uh, it's not the same scenarios you got in the standard Blood Red Skies Battle of Britain box set that were geared towards introducing the game. These now have to introduce a larger game. So they have to introduce attacking carriers and a little bit of airstrike without teaching you the entire part of airstrike. So what are the scenarios in there? Well, there's still a scenario zero uh, where you have a uh, some kind of reconnaissance airplane out there dodging everybody else. So you have scenario zero called hide and seek in this one 
very much uh, similar to the regular scenario zero. Uh, but from there, it starts to go ahead and starts to branch a little bit. So scenario one is still dogfight. Not any cosmic changes in there other than it gives you some suggestions of some of the mixes that could be out there for wildcats versus zeros and how to balance some of that. Then it goes off the rails. And I say that in a good way. <laughs> Scenario two is escort duty. So what you previously remembered uh, from much later from Scenario four in the, in the book, uh, escort duty, you now literally have your, your bombers as your, wood, or your uh, cardboard tokens moving across the board. Yes, they can shoot back, but the whole goal is just to get them across the board. So it's a little different than all the modifications we've seen for, for escort duty. I know you guys have both played Escort Duty a number of times uh, in its original format uh, as a scenario. Uh, this one, I think you guys probably saw, is that it changes up some of the assumptions to it. It changes up some of the ways you deploy. Um, but the intent still is bombers are a moving target, uh, and your goal is to have the bombers survive. Any, uh, any other things that you guys thought about um, based on seeing uh, either one of those scenarios? They all look you know, pretty familiar to what we already know about. It's the ones after this that seem oh, yeah. to be entirely new. <laughs> you know. I, I do think it's important. Like you said, they do give you kind of that, uh, it's historical, like, okay, if you want to play your first escort duty, try playing with these planes and these bombers. I, I, I do think that's a really nice touch that wasn't in the initial battle of Britain. So, right. Right. Yeah, you, it was very much canned in that sense for Battle of Britain because you had your, your two options, DO-17s um, and uh, Blenheim 4s. So it, it, this one is, is kind of cool because it steps you in and it gets you ready to then go into scenarios three and four. Uh, three being the uh, torpedo run, four being the carrier strike. So torpedo bombers in the first one, uh, dive bombers in the second one. And those really, uh, I thought, were good because they were... Uh, condensed versions of what you need from airstrike. So unlike we normally do when we attack a ship in airstrike, well, we have to go look at the table and then we apply the traits and then we figure out how many dice <laughs> dice we roll. Literally, that was all broken down for you and, and was already explained to you that you roll this many dice for this many successes to get a hit on the carrier and you need this many hits to sink it. Um, so I thought that was a, a cool way to do to break people in to show you Yes, the game does handle torpedo bombers and dive bombers, and they're different, um, but it also didn't open up the entire can of worms that you get in airstrike, uh, especially if you're attacking shipping and doing things like that. Because I know Brett has laughed as he as he tried to uh, torpedo the uh, the cruisers there at Malta uh, and all the different things between the you know anti-aircraft and other fighters and, and those things making life difficult. All right, so... After those are the last scenarios, that pretty much sums up most of the starter kit and the other aircraft that you see via the starter kit. We know there's some other tied Pacific releases coming out. Uh, we know there are going to be F-6, F Hellcats at some point. We've only been talking about them for a year and a half, almost two years now. Uh, those will be out there. We'll see what other Japanese aircraft uh, on the fighter side are released. I think we can probably all bet that it will be something like the Oscar. <laughs> that would make sense uh, for the time periods that they're covering. Uh, we'll see what actually gets released. And then obviously from there, there's a lot of other branch things they can add uh, for various bombers, various twin engine fighters, um, and maybe hopefully a return to the Mediterranean because all that work we've seen with the Italians is still sitting somewhere in a warlord vault somewhere, uh, you know, with renderings and cards and, and all the goodness we've seen there. So we know that they're... They haven't abandoned the European theater. Uh, just we, th we think there's going to be a fairly large glut of things to get through uh, for, the, uh, for the Pacific theater. All right, wrapping this up, all joking aside, uh, anything else, Brett, that you want to say about the Midway set that either you saw in the video today or that you've seen in some of the behind the scenes that we've been given? No, I'm just really excited to get you know new starter set. I'm, I'm encouraged that it'll bring more new players in. And just for my own benefit, I'm excited just to, you know, I don't really know much about the Pacific theater. And I think this is an opportunity for me to start diving in and learning more as I play games and start painting planes and that kind of thing. Yeah. So what that means is Scott Atchison, if you have a book on the Pacific, send it. <laughs> Brett needs to study up. <laughs> I know nothing. He knows nothing. Well, yeah, I, I do kind of laugh that 
this is going to be good to have a, a starter set. And of course, some retailer who will remain nameless uh, was holding out on six Battle of Britain starter sets that they literally just kind of dropped on us. And I laugh. I'm like, what am I supposed to do with these now? Are these collector's items? <laughs> We've been clamoring for these for the last couple of months. But anyway, that's all right. I digress. Steve, any last minute thoughts? Uh, I like it. I think we made a lot of fun of it. We but I think it's, I think it's clear that they did hear the complaints of what people said about previous models Absolutely. and metal models and shrinking models. And they tried to remedy it the best way they could with the resources that they have to invest in one of their more niche right. games. Well, right? it's not bolt action, but, so you're not going to get all the plastic. It's not Epic yeah, I mean, ACW. I'm buying it. <laughs> right? I mean, at the end of the day, like, do I recommend it as a buy? If you like the game, definitely yeah. buy it. If you're getting into the game definitely a better purchase than the battle of britain starter set was yep. Yep. three years ago yep. or whatever Absolutely. it was so it's it's an improvement all I, I think the fact is the models will paint up better can you can you nitpick the models yes you can uh but who cares because you'll get a rule book you'll get some templates you get all the other little stuff that i get it you're gonna probably buy that anyway because you're gonna go out and you're gonna buy steve toth's version of the templates <laughs> but the fact is it's a great way to start. Figure out if you like the game. Split it with a buddy of yours. So like Brett did to sucker me in. Yeah, man, no worries. You can just borrow half of my models. And then I end up buying my own starter kit. I see how that works. But anyway, uh, I think it's a good way to get into it. And so if you're the Warlord video person, I will now publicly apologize to you from the bottom of our hearts here at Lead Pursuit Podcast. Um, but literally, there's like 10,000 people on Instagram you could have asked to help you with that video. So <laughs> with that being said... Thank you, Warlord. Thanks for giving us some information today. And thanks especially for all the preview information um, that Warlord has sent us and allowed us to see to be able to really give the community an idea of, of what's coming up uh, and to kind of answer some of the questions and hopefully uh, allay some of the concerns as to how things are going to turn out in the Midway starter set. So for the Lead Pursuit podcast, thank you very much. Please go out, like our podcast on iTunes, on Google. Uh, leave us some comments. Tell us what you don't like. Send us an email. Uh, go out on social media and tell us that we're the biggest jerks in the world for making fun of some poor social media person who had to make that video. Um, but yes, we, we know we're big jerks, so you don't need to send us that comment. <laughs> but thank you very much. Keep listening, and we'll talk to you next week.